The interesting thing about tonight's subject is that every person is a master of contemplation. And that's all we have to make clear. Now, there is a difficulty, however. You see, if you know something, but you don't know that you know it, then you can't use it. If you know something, and you don't know that you really know it, and have quite a bit of experience in it, it's even worse. But it's a far greater problem if whatever you're doing is the very thing you want to study, and you don't know that you're doing it all the time. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see how we can make that clear. Would you agree that coming here, you have to have a goal? Right. To launch yourself to come here this evening, you had to consider it. Ah, you had to think about what other alternatives were open to you. You had to consider two most important things. How to consider whether or not it was going to justify the effort that you're going to go through giving up an evening to explore this subject. When I think everyone here knows that most talks about contemplation aren't worthwhile, or meditation, they're simply not worthwhile. But you risked it. All right, now look here. You made the decision to come. Ah, goal. After you made the decision, then you had some concerns about whether it was the right decision or not. So therefore, there was a conflict you had to resolve to get here. All the ways in which you waited back and forth, and then you decided to move. So the conflict was over, and then you decided. Now look here. To get here means you had to keep that idea in your mind. And therefore, if you, keep, if you keep an idea on your mind, you have an object to direct your attention to, that's a contemplation. That is formally meditation. Now, there are three words. Concentration, meditation, and contemplation. Now, these three are merely variations of one thing, which is why in Hinduism and yoga, these are called the samyamas, because when they're taken together, it's a samyama. Sam meaning together, yama, the study of. That study which takes all these things together is a samyama. So therefore, if you do a samyama on something, you're concentrating on it. What's the difference between concentration and meditation? The continuous application of concentration is meditation. It's a different step. The continuous staying with your object of meditation, you'll then join with it. That's contemplation. It's one thing, three stages. So you made a decision. The decision you made meant, therefore, that you'd keep an idea on your mind. And as you came, as you were journeying, you had to think about it. It came up. It came up again and again. Am I doing the right thing? What can I expect? So around this goal, a whole bunch of ideas were built. Maybe I have a question I'd like to explore. I wonder whether it's going to be interesting. I wonder whether it's going to be worth my while. They cluster around the goal. And 
Now we can do the same thing by saying, if someone now wants to go to college, why do they want to go to college? Why do they want to go to school? Why do they want to read a book? They have something on their mind, and once they have something on their mind, then they can release, they can release right, their energy in pursuit of it. You have to release it. You have to say, I'm going to do it. If you don't make that decision, you're just going along. Therefore, if you release it in respect to this goal, now a new kind of energy is available. Now, once that energy is available, that highlights and fills this with interest. Therefore, there's a growing interest. These two things then, right? Energy and interest go together. They go together. If you decide to go to college, what are you going to go to college for? You're going to go for a job. What are you going to go to a job for? Would you not agree that the reason you're going to go through a course of action involving many stages, such as college, is only because, only because of one thing. You think by taking that course of action that you are going to benefit. You're going to think it's worth your while. You think you are going to benefit. That is to say, be made better. That's benefit, to be made better. Sometimes we go further and we think if we secure our goal, get our degrees, get the job we want, then in the end we'll have success and happiness, right? Success and happy. And so we keep this goal on our mind, we commit ourselves to it, and then that releases energy, and then we try to add more, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have this and that all in respect to our goal? And that builds up interest, that builds up energy and power, and therefore that pushes along to our goal. Now, nature of this conflict. I want to now go into the nature of the conflict. Any time anyone decides to achieve some goal that they think is going to benefit them and make them better, then there's going to be a counterforce against it. To the degree, it's a question of degree, to the very degree that a person has ideas about themselves that are irreconcilable with that goal, to that degree they're in a state of conflict and they're going to have all kinds of difficulties achieving that goal. To get out of this, of course, we often take secondary goals and escape that. But let's not do that for a moment, all right? Let's look at one of these. Would you not agree that one of these beliefs, one of these beliefs that we might have, is that you want to struggle because then you will be different. You will be different. Success will make you happy. It will overcome those feelings right now what? Because there's a sense in which you expect with success and happiness you will be finally adequate. You will have achieved. You will be there. Right? You will be there. You can then be satisfied. You'll possess the object of your concern. You'll be satisfied. You'll be sated once you achieve it. That means you're willing to go through this to change. Well, that means before you didn't look here. It means that... Uh, you had some belief about yourself, then you wanted to see if you could change it by going through this course of action. That means, does it not, that we're using the goals of success to bring about changes in us, in our psyche. We want changes in our soul, in our psyche. That's what we want. Wouldn't you agree that once you fix this goal, job, teaching, engineers, whatever it is you might want to be, that once you get the insight that maybe you're not going to be happy doing this, that maybe it's not going to do these things, you face a crisis. The usual way to solve that crisis is to say, 
<laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but that wasn't a good enough goal. I need another degree on top of that. I need a better job. I need to work with a bigger firm. I need to get a bigger car. I have to get something beyond that. That wasn't enough to bring about this change because I'm really seeking to change through work. That's a karma yoga. I expect by dedication and work to change my inner state of being. Now look here. Suppose right here there's an underlying belief this person has that they in some sense feel inadequate. That gnawing feeling, there's something wrong with me. Well, then this is the way to change it, to get your goal, to sacrifice in every way for your goal. Then you'll see that by the very success, you are then happy, and you've gained your success. Now look here, see this? That means within us, within us, Right in there, within us, this beautiful picture of a man. Right in this beautiful picture of a man, there is something curious, and that's this thing which we're calling a belief. Now, if you have one of these, you don't think of it as a belief, you think it's true. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions and see if you can go along with me. This idea of not being adequate, inadequate in any degree, carries along with it an image. With every image, there's also an attitude. With every image that you have of yourself, there's an attitude Consistent with that are gestures, right? Our gestures, mannerisms, it all comes together because within us there is this idea and image of ourself. Now, what that means, you see, is something like this. One is we may not regard it as a belief because we think it's true. So what that means is, you see, that here's a realm of belief, and here we are. We participate in this realm of belief. We participate in it. And accordingly, we have an idea of ourself right in there. That's what we have. And when we, ref when we think about it, or when our, we don't have to think about it, when our thoughts bounce off this, when our thoughts bounce off that, we notice something curious. And I wonder whether or not, I think maybe we'll even do it tonight. These images we have of the self, you can easily identify, and once you start playing in this realm of, of meditation, contemplation, it's extremely important to make notes. To make notes. Because of the following reasons, you see. As you approach your goal, at any stage, once you decide to do it, there's going to be this sense of opposition to it because it's irreconcilable with that image you have of yourself. I don't think I'm good enough, perhaps, to achieve it. Maybe I need something else. Gee, I see other people are approaching that goal. I wonder if they're really happy. I wonder whether or not you really can change. I wonder whether success really changes you. I wonder whether you can really benefit. In what way am I really going to be better? Maybe I have to have a higher goal because the lower one may not get it, and then you keep going for higher and higher goals because you're driven by this image of inadequacy. Hmm.
We need to study this little guy. And this is the way you study him. If you decide to sit or stand, however you're going to do it, just watch your thoughts. Just watch, right? Just watch your thoughts. That's all. Just take a look at them come and go. Just watch them. Now, sometimes a very interesting way to proceed with that is just to think of numbers occurring in your mind from 1 to 10 and over again and 1 to 10 and over again. And while you're doing that, you will see at some point you'll lose the number and you'll go off on a tangent. So you're reasoning, you're there, you're contemplating, you're meditating on numbers. Where do the numbers come from? Where do they go? And you're intent. So you're showing interest. We're going to get the conflict. You're telling yourself to do this. This becomes your goal. If you can do that goal with impunity, there's no conflict. How does the conflict emerge? It interrupts this interesting yet very simple meditation. And it interrupts it by taking you off on a tangent. Now let this be the tangent. All right, let this be the tangent. Now, that's the area of a tangent. Notice what happens. You forget the numbers. You forget your goal, and you become absorbed into something. You become absorbed. You become absorbed in a tangent. The tangent has a storyline to it. The storyline has a drama to it. The drama has a figure to it, a figure a image, and that's of yourself. That's of the self. What do you do then? According to this way of proceeding with meditation, you do not fight it, you do not get upset over it, you're interested in discovering what is perhaps the most important of all things in this game. There are two things important, but one is far more important than the other. You want to see what it was that you fell asleep into. See, it's like a falling asleep. You want to see what it is that allowed you to go into this tangent or daydream or drama. Because that's falling asleep. That's falling into ignorance. That's giving up your goal. Ah, remember, so there was something far more important. Now, no one can tell you about this. You have to see it for yourself. Let me restructure it for a moment, since I'm so good at artwork. Let us assume now you're now proceeding. One, two, three, four. You lose five. You lose five, and off you go on a tangent. You, you, if you're into this, you must see what kind of figures are represented in that tangent. In that drama, there's going to be a figure and an image. That image is of yourself. That figure is of yourself. That's why you can identify with it. See, the mystery of daydreams is how is it that we have them? How is it that we lose consciousness and slip out of this purposeful activity that we've been doing, which was watching the numbers? That's our goal, watch the numbers, that's all. How is it that we could fall into this? Well, that's easy. It's an image of ourselves. We identified with our own image. Therefore, this identification
This identification that we have with that image propels us with it, and it has a storyline, and it has a drama, and you want to collect both. You want to see whether you can get a very good description of that image, and you want to find something about that story. That story is terribly significant. That story is very significant. Because it's what you think follows if you have that image. <laughs> That's the problem, see? They go together. Given the image, well, you think it's quite natural that if you have that image, you're going to have that drama. And therefore, the content of the drama spills out naturally. No effort. You don't even have to think about it. It comes quite spontaneous, and you go off on your daydream. Remember, we said there's something terribly important about that, and that's this. Then, what happens? Oh! Let's see, what, was, what, what happened? You wake up. You fall asleep here. Now, this is a special kind of sleep. You forgot your goal. This is a forgetting, an amnesia. Right? This is a very interesting amnesia or forgetfulness. This is a very interesting forgetfulness. You forget your goal. You forget the fact that you're involved in a process. You forget you have a higher aim. That's right. That's what you do. Therefore, we need to look at this moment. This is the most significant thing in human experience right here. For some reason, for some reason, you wake up to the fact that it was a daydream, that you were made this identification. And you know what that means? Several things. One is the drama played itself out to the point where you couldn't go any further. The image doesn't go any further. It reaches a wall. That's why you wake up. Or, or what is most interesting, some external sound or something might interrupt it sufficiently strong that you then have to wake up and see that that's not you. That's the key. Hey, you know what? When you wake up, the reason you wake up is you recognize that that thing isn't me. That's not me. I don't have to identify with that. That's enlightenment. That's a mini enlightenment. You recognize you are not that image. Another word for the image is a mask, a persona. Right? It's a persona. It's a mask. It's not us. It's a mask we wear. A mask that we learn to put on. A mask that we know what we get for it. We know how to manipulate with that mask. In the daydream, then, it reaches a point where you wake up and see that's not you. That's a moment of the, that is the moment where you recognize something is not you. That's not you. That's not worthy of you. You wake up. Hey, look here. To wake up to the fact that there's an underlining false image of the self, it's a kind of enlightenment. That's a species of enlightenment. Therefore, you want to study this. What is it like at that moment, at the precise moment when that occurs? Contrast it with that moment here when you're falling asleep, where you're losing your goal and slip into the image. You have to contrast the two. Because in this state, you gain back something very important. You get back your interest. You get back your energy. When you identify with this figure, right, you are propelled, but you have to keep going the whole drama. That's draining. That's draining. Now, some people have discovered a way of making it work. At other times, they may use the excitement of something else. Uh, sometimes identifying with a figure in a movie, in a TV, or a novel, or a story. Go along with it. See yourself as it. That's another way. It works. Sometimes it's necessary to sustain this, where sometimes many sexual fantasies are used, 
not because if someone has an interest in sexuality, but sexuality gives a certain energy. The sexual energy is going to be released for the purposes of maintaining the tangent, the fantasy, the daydream. That's what you need to propel it. Therefore, at that moment when you wake up, would you not agree? For a moment, whew, there's energy. There's alertness. With that alertness and that energy available, for a split second, you are clear. No image of the self operating. It doesn't last long because the other one comes back in and then you might call yourself the following names for wasting your time on a tangent. That's part of feeling inadequate. I mean, you have to have reasons for being inadequate and thinking you're inadequate. And one of the best ways of doing it is to say, see, I wasted my time on daydreams. I, here I had a goal. And now you punish yourself in one way or belittle yourself or criticize yourself. All of these come out of this picture. So you get two stories. You get the tangent, and then you get what I call the judgment of the fantasy. <coughs> How do you, what kinds of things do you say about yourself for doing that, for not staying on your goal? They go together because the judgment is further fuel that, that convinces you that this image you have of yourself is right. Where in reality, in reality, what you're doing is you are meditating. This is meditation. Why is it meditation? Because you have an idea in your mind. It shapes an image an attitude, every gesture is involved in that image. That image then can take its form in fantasies and tangents, spontaneous ones. It can give you all the material you need for this story. Now we want to work on the story. Now we want to work on the story. There are only a finite number of stories you can have. And they're very few. There's something about the theme of these stories that you have to become aware of. If possible, you should sketch them out. You should sketch them out very briefly so that you have no more than six. Get six. That's all you need. All you need is six then watch the next time it comes up. Watch the next time you have a spontaneous fantasy, and then all you have to do is check which one of these it is. And you'll see that all of them are really the result of just a few stories and their variations. Now, what is significant about that? When it's going on, your mind is focused on it. You're captured along with the story. There you are, you're meditating. You're absorbed. You're involved. It's formal meditation. Why? Pratyahara in Sanskrit and yoga is being able to turn off all of the data from the senses all the data from the senses. Pull in, see that's a tortoise, tortoise, turtle. Right. Pull in all of the senses. Don't be concerned in any way with the external world. Pull in any reflection, the intellect. Be totally absorbed within yourself. Hey, contemplation. What does it mean then now that you see that you're contemplating, that's what it is. You're contemplating. You're an expert. 
You want to see how, he, how, how significant these themes are? Ask your neighbor, friend of yours, if they would mind if you take over a couple of their fantasies because you're interested in trying them out. Unthinkable, isn't it? Unthinkable. It won't match your image. Unthinkable. You'll change it even if you pick up part of it. You'll change it into some storyline of your own. What is significant about that? Here, look here. See, One of the important things in meditation is mantras. Repeating certain things. Mantras, say, mantras. These are mantras telling the stories over and over again. They're spontaneous mantras. They're coming out of your own experience. You are your own teacher. You're giving yourself a mantra. Now, I, as a good number of you here know, I'm called this curious thing of a philosophical midwife. Now let me say why this fits for a moment. All right, look here. Two things are essential to study the mind. If you're a carpenter, not only must you know how to use the tools, but you have to know where your best tools come from. You have to be able to select them. You have, not any tool is equally as good. You must know where they come from and how to use them. So you need use and origin. You use them, these ideas, in this way. But unless you know their origin, you won't appreciate what's going on. Let's try it. The origin of these themes is very simple. These themes are fragments. They are fragments. They're a peculiar kind of fragment. They're fragments that have a momentum to them. They have a momentum to them. They operate nearly inde well, independently of you. You allow it. You succumb to it. But no, no. The storyline has its, its way of proceeding. Therefore, it has a certain energy. By the way, did we not say a moment ago? And you also must have an interest. Remember that? These themes are fragments. The fragments have an energy and you have an interest in them because you can identify with them. To know where they have their origin is to discover this. See? Each one of these is a fragment. And you want to see how it fits in. What is the whole of which this is a fragment? See, every storyline repeats itself in a variety of ways. If you're going to look at these six themes, and then you have a little notebook next to you, and you just check how many times, Oh, I assure you, in a week, you're going to have a great number of them. Why is that important? Because you can see they're going over and over and over again, varying perhaps, that's true, but the same theme. Because these things seek a resolution. Hey, the mind offers them to you to find their source to bring them home, to complete. The mind gives them to you so that you can seek their origin and find their place. Proper place. That's what you need, you see, to find their proper place. What happens when that happens? You won't have that theme anymore. That's all, you won't have that theme anymore because of an important reason. When you find the whole of which the theme is a fragment, you will see that this whole, which is so significant, this whole 
is one of the major contributors to that image you have of yourself. Therefore, you see, man is not irrational. Man's mind is giving you all the time the very tools you need through which to know yourself. You are involved in a continuous meditation. There's only one thing you need to do that you're not doing. That's right here. The intellect. It's time to put the intellect back into meditation. Because if what's going on in your mind are the very tools and the uses of the mind, well, then you might as well know the origin of those tools and how to use them. Otherwise, you'll be fighting them in a conflict that, that's opposed to yourself. It's against yourself. Now, what is absolutely beautiful about the mind, absolutely, it's a staggering benefit. Man's mind is an astonishing benefit, intrinsically beneficial, because as you reach for those significant goals, all right, if we had that beautiful picture before, as you try reaching for the most, most significant goal, the conflicts become more visible. Ha! Get up! Get up! Don't sit anymore! I don't like that teacher. I don't like where I am. I think it's time for me. My legs hurt. Time to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything to pull you away from reaching the goal. Because the achievement of those goals is in conflict with that idea. And the mind, therefore, right? It's not in conflict with itself. It looks that way, but it isn't. You know what it is? Look here, it's this, isn't it? If you want to know what's blocking you, if you want to know why you're going through suffering and why you're not achieving your goal, well, then pick some goal that's most significant. The higher the significant, the greater it is to see it. The easier it is to see it, that's simple. You want something easy? Go for the highest goal. Go for the highest goal. If you have the highest goal, you must have a method or this won't work. You have to know what you're doing. Why? Because if you have a method, you know precisely where you are stuck. It can't be a general method without stages because that's just a dream. So therefore, as you approach this goal, then these images and thoughts and strategies will come in, not to block you, they do block you, not to block you, they do block you. You know what it does? It gives you a chance, it gives you a chance to see the images you have of yourself that are blocking your goal. It's fortuitous, it's saying, hey, look, 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 look here, you want that goal? If it's irreconcilable with this belief, we have to challenge this belief, but you don't know it. Therefore, I'll give you a vivid example of it. As you try reaching that goal and the closer you come to it, then these tangents, these so-called struggles, will give you the very thing you need. Therefore, it's a totally rational system, and it works to your highest benefit so long as you're willing to struggle for the highest thing. Because if you want to see yourself and you want to see what's blocking you, you will see that all of this is true. Because that's the way the mind functions. This is the way the mind functions. We are engaged continuously in a contemplation. Now we have to do it deliberately, see? Now we have to do it deliberately. That's all. If this is what we're doing, let's do it. If you are idle and you're not doing anything for a few minutes, day, whatever it is, watch what comes across. Ah, there's another one. Hmm. Noted. Noted. Now, 
these ideas called beliefs are so powerful because they include something very significant and that is they include our roles in life. It not only includes images, attitudes, gestures, but it gives us a role, gives us a way of being that's threatened by the highest goals. They're threatened. Therefore, the mind then shows you what blocks you and invites you to consider it. Therefore, when you're sitting or when you're engaged in meditation, there is an essential thing without which, right, without which you will spend many a day building up concentration, the power of concentration. And concentration is worth developing, sometimes called jiriki and zen. And it is important building that up. There's something more important, though. Look here. Integrity. <clears throat> there is no meditation that is successful without integrity. You have to develop, you have to develop this curious stuff within you. <clears throat> now, what do I mean? Part of the themes that you are going to face all the time are unfinished business. Things you forgot about that you should have done. Don't let it go into this judgment, I'm no good because I didn't do these things. Don't open that door. You want integrity. What does that mean? That means when these come up, you have to honestly say to yourself, I'll take care of them. I'll take care of that. Plan something with each of these unfinished things. Okay, one comes across, you didn't do this, so you say to yourself, by gosh, you're right, I didn't and I should have. As soon as I get back, as soon as I have a break, I'll make the phone call. I'll drop the note. Discharge, see, discharge each of these. Rob them of their energy. Don't allow them to stay. They have energy. Energy from you. Deprive them of that energy. How? Honesty. How? Let's see how else you can do it, right? There you are. You're involved in meditation. Let's say it's even formal meditations, like sometimes they have with yoga or in uh, Zen sitting or at home when you're just meditating. When these things come up, a couple of them are very important and they may take this form. Is what I am experiencing Significant? Anytime you have a question that involves a judgment about you, you have to see whether you have the background to make that judgment or not. If you don't have the background to make that judgment, then you have to find out from someone, somewhere, about the truth of that. Is what I am experiencing this or that or the other thing? Then you want to find someone who can say, yes, I'll tell you about this, that, or the other thing, and I'll tell you whether or not that's what you should be experiencing at this time, and whether or not your mind should be open to these things or not. In other words, not only is there unfinished business that comes to your mind, but also judgments about yourself. Therefore, what do you do? Integrity. You say to yourself, the next time I meet X, Y, or Z, the Roshi or the Yogi Master, I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to allow it to be judged. Integrity. Don't do it yourself. Unless you're fully convinced that you can make that judgment. Then it's worthwhile at some later time 
finding out whether you are capable of making those judgments or not. Raise it up. Always raise the problem up. Now, why is that important? This is very extremely important. And I'd like to now push this just a couple of more steps. The mind is very creative. It is so creative. If you don't watch out, <laughs> if you don't watch out, you might get just what you want. Hold it now. There's a problem here, you see. You might, guess, you might get just what you want, but you may not know whether what you're getting is really what you want. See, it's the same question, judgment and integrity. Let us say now, the individual now is functioning, able now to do all of this work that we've been describing. And notice it doesn't take any work in one sense. You're just making notes, having fun doing it, learning about yourself. All right, learning about yourself. Now let us assume now the individual now finds himself in what might be regarded as some kind of transcendent experience. The mind is so creative it can fashion what you want. It can fashion out of your hopes and dreams those things that are consistent with this image in your, in your mind. And this is what's called macchio. This is what's called maya. This is called being deluded about the reality of a class of experiences that you've had. Why is that? Because in that image of yourself, there can also be things that you think are so important for yourself to have that then the mind then will fashion out of your own dreams these things which are close, close to what is real, but it's an illusion. The ability to separate the reality from the illusion, the makya, the maya, the delusion, can only, can only be done by someone who themselves have gone through these and is able to distinguish I'm able to distinguish between the appearance and reality. If under similar circumstances you can expect similar things to occur, then someone who has had the experience of working with people who have been meditating can tell again and again through their experience that there's a certain kind of macchio, maya, delusion that occurs very close when you're at the point where you're very close to the real. The mind will want to then grasp onto this because it's an image and say, I made it. This must be it. And that will just inflate, that will just inflate the image of the self. Therefore, in this wonderful game, since there's integrity at the cornerstone of every meditation practice, you don't judge. You let those judge who can judge. And if you think you can judge, then you want to see whether or not your judgment is sound by having your whole structure examined, whether or not you're capable of judging as a whole. Now, there are some states of mind which are beatific, light, 
luminosity, openness, clarity, all kinds of things, all kinds of things. They occur, they occur, let this be the, let this be, in kundalini yoga, the awakening of the kundalini goes through each of the centers, spills over in the shashuma into the mind itself. Right? and through the Ajna Chakra, the third, I mean the uh, second most uh, chakra, the Ajna Chakra. And one has such an experience which is appropriate to that level. For each major experience, there's a whole set which are similar to it, but it is not that. And it is a it's an interesting study to see how Zen masters and yoga masters distinguish between the makyo, the mayas, and the delusions, and what's real. What they have to do, this is their test. This is their test. And this is why this game is really a very fine and noble game. All right. Here you are. Here's the master. You're in a certain state in which you are exhibiting a certain state. He will ask you a question. That question then will see to what degree you can then say what is most real to you while bypassing the image. To the degree that he can see this image surface in the statement of your experience or in the way in which you are at that very moment, knows immediately that is a shallow experience. What should he then urge you to do? Hey, you're close. You're close. Machio is close. Now, with the greatest of all possible integrity, Sincerity, power, interest, strive on. So he has to ask you something or, or respond to what you're bringing. You see, you're bringing something to him, the fruit of your work. He has to look at it and then immediately, immediately judge it in such a way that you can see for yourself whether it's real or false. Simultaneously, bang, bang, over, done. In the judgment of the state, whatever the master says, must be of such clarity that the person who has the question and wants that state judged can immediately see whether he's right or wrong. There are some times when the person doesn't see they're right or wrong because they are insisting that they want to keep and they want to express themselves through that image and therefore they will be in a very characteristic way of being which is fraudulent and they may not see it. Which is why it's so important to do this kind of study because then you're getting close to what it is that's driving it. And therefore you won't confuse the two. Therefore, those two possibilities occur. One, ideally, you present the fruit of your work, of your life, of your struggles. That person can judge it, can pr judge it and express it with such clarity that immediately the person who has the question can see the truth of it. And if they can see the truth of it, then they can jump one more step. On the other hand, if the person says, oh, no, no, he can't really see. I'm better, I can judge myself, lost integrity, to continue the game. The game of establishing that image. Now, in the very practice of this game, all right, let's take this person out. What are the signs you might still be under the influence of one of these little images of the self. 
It's really interesting, you see. We pay a price for every image of the self. That image of the self contains an image of the self that has implications on the whole physiology of man. You can't have an image of yourself that isn't in some way visible to someone else. Oh, that's you. Oh, you're acting like yourself. Oh, that's characteristic of you. That is to say, in the whole muscle structure of your face, and your, all of your mannerisms, even the slightest, this image molds and shapes. It molds and shapes. As a consequence, it has a muscular effect as well, emotional and muscular. What does that mean? That means that in order to keep that image going, because part of the image is to get other people to react to it rather than to your true self, therefore they have to see it, therefore it's a mask, therefore it's visible to them, therefore you want them to treat it in a certain way. Therefore, as you're proceeding into this higher state and challenging the false images of yourself, you will notice them at some critical point that you have to drop all tension. All physical tensions you have to drop. You have to look for them to see where they might be, even in the face, even around the eyes, even around the nose. Wherever it is, you have to release it because that's nothing other than evidence of this little guy. That's integrity, see? That's what you're going to do. Because to the degree that there is nothing here, to that degree there's no tension anywhere. Because tension is a function of those masks and images. Therefore, you are then going to have to say, look here. I'm here to explore the mind. I want to know the mind. It's my mind. I want to know all about it. Before I drop dead, I want to know what it is. I want to know what, it, what makes it up. I want to know how to use it. I want to know everything going on in it. I want to maximize my seeing, my understanding. Have that kind of a goal, you won't have any trouble. Accept difficulties that are important for you to resolve. Because each of these things that block you are nothing other than challenges. They're not negative. They're not bad vibes. They're challenges that the mind gives you that are appropriate to every single level of your struggle. Therefore, no judgment against yourself while sitting. Positive or negative. Every time you think you're something, you're down. Every time you think you're this, you're down. Every time you criticize yourself, unfair. No judgments. Why? You're going to have enough integrity just to try to be your best. And in being yourself, you will then see all the things that come up that keep us in one way or the other from being the best. Why? Because it's appropriate to our level of development that this could show itself for us to work on. Therefore, this is a just universe. See, this is just. It's just that we have the problems when they come up. It's appropriate to our particular stage. To get out of the means we have to go within ourselves with greater integrity and fairness, that's all part of integrity. Have to be just with yourself. This willingness to do that then settles you. It settles you. Put it the other way around. It doesn't settle you, you're doing fine. It drops away the, the tie, the, the adherence to these images. And why are they so difficult? we think they're true. No image of the self, no matter how lofty, no matter how lofty, is true. No negative image could possibly be true. Because in the highest states of mind, where presumably then at the highest states of mind you're seeing through the soul itself, it has no qualities. No qualities. Keep clear, clear, open.
expansive. But even in that state, if you can't ask what is it that is experiencing at this very moment, you may not be going clear enough, deep enough. You see, the one thing that can keep you going through this is the appreciation of the question. See, a question is being on a quest. This is a quest. You're on a quest. The highest quest is, okay, what is it that is experiencing right now? You see, is it one of these things in here? What is it that's the source of all of this? What is it that's experiencing? What is this thing? that I am. So even if you're in a beautiful, clear, open, expansive, infinitely clear state, if you can't ask the question, hey, right now at this very moment, what's so darn clear? You have to go further. Thank goodness. So, I'm sure you have a bunch of questions. Why don't I open up for a few questions? I was driving up here, and suddenly a thought as I was driving up came to my mind. And the question was, I haven't had a car accident for a long time. Oh. I'm due for a car accident. Of course, this immediately brought so, lots of judgment. Right, 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 you know, right. Really, I haven't had one for a long time. I'm due for one. Hear it? Right. And yeah. then the next thing yeah. is, wow, you know, this is not a good thought to have. You know, let's get rid of it before it That's right. actually... That's right. It could also be a wake-up call. Well, that, my final solution was, yeah. oh, I better drive carefully. See? Uh, See? You paid attention. You used integrity. Hey, I'm going to listen to that voice. See, the more you listen to these voices and treat them with their due respect, then you gain respect for yourself. No matter what kind of a thought it is, no matter how horrendous it might look, hey, it's coming out of you for a reason. Find out what's significant about the fact that it's emerging now. That's what you want to see. It's a fragment. Find the whole of which it's a part. Yes. I'm sure you have a question. <laughs> I remember it is our relative. We said some meditating monks were so spiritually advanced in their meditation that at night they were seen to radiate with light. Yes, on Mount Athos, right. And S-A-I-B-A-B-A -B -A -B -A was the name of one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that fit into this? First of all, that story comes out of those two separate stories. One comes out of Marciad Iliad, wrote a work, many works on yoga. And one of the examples he gives is this story that they, are, they were witnesses, apparently reliable witnesses, that when monks were meditating in their monastery at night, when no lights, no modern lighting was available, some of their cells shone with brilliance from their own luminosity. Sai Baba, in one of his works, was said to have taken a group, a small group of people up on a hill, and he himself, in their midst, experienced that kind of light. That's called the transfiguration experience. Now, what is it you want to explore about that? Um, of course, Jesus Christ, of course, uh, in the three Gospels is said to have had a transfiguration experience on top of the mountain, where Peter was along with him, remember? And out of that light came Moses and Elijah, and they had a talk. And I assure you, that must have been some dialogue. Right? right? And as they're coming down, Peter said, hey, do you want me to build a couple of tabernacles for you? Three? One for each? Okay, what's the point you want to make out of it? Yes, they the are first, recorded first experiences want, like this. Yes. The first thing I, I want to know about is that the way I understand the Jesus stories hmm. 
are mythological. And I don't know if the other stories are said to be in reality what happened, like someone transcended mm. and you could see light and not believe it, but yeah, you don't see light, do you? I guess the question revolves around light itself. Right. One doesn't see light. One sees colors. You don't see light. Light doesn't have any color. Right. If you could see light, then what's between my eye and this would have a color. If I could see light, I would be able to see something colored, wouldn't I? So, what's interesting is that people don't know what light is. They know color, but they don't experience light. So that's important. But here, for this, let me change it a bit. Uh, there are many books dealing with this question. This is sometimes called Divine Luminosity. And uh, Rudolf Otto also wants to call these kinds of experience numinosity out of the real, emerging out of the real. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, there are three planes of existence after death. And I advise you, uh, because of your interest in this, you would find it well worthwhile to read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. At the moment of death, according to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Every person experiences this divine luminosity. Sometimes it's so brief that it's only as long as the winking of an eye. But nonetheless, everyone experiences it. The whole book of the Tibetan Book of the Dead is to try to, re is try to remind the person who's dying, since it's a funerary book, you're supposed to read it tw when someone has died. You're supposed to read it into their left ear, by the way. You're supposed to remind them that they are experiencing this realm. And this is called the Chikai stage. The Chikai stage. Light. Uh, then there's the Chanyad. The Chanyad is uh, seven days where you experience all kinds of luminosity of various kinds called peaceful deities. And then there's a 49-day period, at least, where you then face the contents of your own mind, all your own fears, everything in your own mind you face that's negative. And as you flee from this, see, you're fleeing, curiously enough, from this, we flee from the light because we're after the preservation of those images. Therefore, after death, you experience the contents of your own mind, all the fears, all the worries, all the puzzles, etc. And this propels one into their next reincarnation. It's a very interesting piece of work. Now, for those people who have practiced meditation, it is at this point that the person who is reading the book tries to remind them that they, they have practiced meditation. Now is the time to get back into it. You can still do it. You can reverse it. The whole game in the Tibetan book of the game is reverse it. So that either you can hold yourself in this area here and understand and absorb it, or ideally return to the divine light, divine luminosity. If so, the goal of that then is, then you are off the wheel of reincarnation. Which, of course, is the goal of the Buddhists. Now, going back to the experience, there are many people who have reported similar experiences. There are two kinds. There are those that have experienced it, but we can talk about it in this way. It's a private experience that others may find the person profoundly absorbed in a state, but they do not experience any shadow of it, any display of it beyond themselves. Then there's the claim that this divine luminosity is of such strength that it can be seen by others to various degrees, and that's the kind you're talking about. So there's one experience of two kinds, internal, external. 
Uh, Cosmic Consciousness was a very good book by Burke. He describes one. There, um, Houston Smith describes several. Some people have drug trips where they try to find that state through drugs. What's the problem? The problem is, you see, that you have to come down. And it has nothing to do with this image in your, in your mind. This is the problem. The problem with meditation, the formal problem, the whole problem with contemplation meditation, is not that it's not effective. The problem is that if you pursue it independently of using your mind in the quest for the mind, you're going to come back down the next day after having a magnificent experience, and you still have this little guy in here that's still going to play itself out. You can have very profound experiences very significant spiritual experiences. But they can't be reconciled with that little thing in there. And therefore, all the good that might come of it is short-lived. It's weakened. So what's the problem? The problem is two ways. Up and clean it up. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be in a cycle. Now, that means not that you're not going to benefit by such great experiences. You certainly will. But to the degree that that old image is still there, you're going to then carry out the implications of that idea in everything you do, and that's all there is to it. Until you do what? Find the pieces, see? They're fragments that seek their resolution. It's as if the mind, I put it this way. I enjoy putting it this way, as a matter of fact. It's as if the mind is saying to man, you can have the most profound experience, but unless you reconcile the images in your mind with that experience, as magnificent as they might be, you're not going to be able to carry out the implications of your own vision. Now, there are many stories of yogis and roshis and priests and whatnot who live magnificent lives, who devote themselves to all kinds of important things and then go off on a drunk and ruin it all. Go to Las Vegas, do this and do that. Why? It's not because they didn't have profound experiences. It's because they didn't find that there was something in there that is still playing itself out and they didn't have a way of dealing with it. Or they may have overlooked it. That's right. And uh, yet they claim to be able to, I think the claim is that they're able to get you to a state in life where um, clarity prevails. So they must, I'm just wondering what method they then employ to blow out, <laughs> or in some other way, flush out that image of ignorance um, without, because they will try and block you from doing that kind, the, the kind of yes. Yes. exploration you're See, the problem of enlightenment is a one in many problem. Enlightenment is not one thing. If it were, we wouldn't have any difficulty. But as a matter of fact, in Buddhism, it's eight different steps. In the ox herding picture, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and finally the tenth are different stages of enlightenment. And people can have this, then have this, then have this, then have this. And the most beautiful example of this is Basui, who Kaplow talks about in Three Pillars of Zen. He had a remarkable vision, beautiful state. And many Roshis passed him with that state, but he wasn't unsatisfied with it himself. And so he went on to have one of the great tenth. And that's what, of course, made him historically the most significant, one of the most significant Buddhists. If you can have experience like Basui is said to have described, because you see in the description of Basui in Kaplow, 
He reached the point where every single belief he had burst open like a barrel that's split open that's full of water and it splatters itself on the ground and there's nothing left. That kind of experience only takes place and that may be in the ninth but clearly in the tenth. Tenth oxidating picture. And that's the Dharma, Dharma bum as it is. No one can see him, no one sees him that he's in any way special, but yet wherever he goes, he brings flowers to bloom, etc. Right? If a thousand uh, birds were to scatter flowers upon him, he would be embarrassed because he would stink. Right? That means that, that spirituality would in some way be detected, and that means he isn't pure enough yet. So, a very good thing to, to explore are these stages. And the ox herding pictures is a very good way. Tibetans have 25 stages. They have uh, eight. Uh, uh, Tozan has five, very famous Buddhist. Um, we like to think in some way that Dante had levels and stages of, of enlightenment or, or holiness in uh, uh, divine comedy. But it's a great game, isn't it? It is the game. This is man's game. This is really where man is. Yeah. I was reading this book by Ibn Arabi. Uh, he was describing yeah. some, um, some um, levitation. Yes. And, you know, I imagine he's not a liar, so whatever. Mm -hmm. It is either it's a symbolic thing that later on, you know, we're reading and imagining, you know, taken literally, or it is something that he subjectively he experienced himself. I mean, he definitely, I don't believe, was trying to... Yes, you're quite right. You're quite right. There are states of mind that you can experience in sitting where that is, that is, <coughs> pardon me, there is decidedly the experience that you're being uplifted. It's, it's, at, it's there. And you might even have to look down. And he doesn't, he yes. somebody else who comes to him in the middle yeah. of the Now, if uh, someone else came ocean, along, yeah, someone yeah. else came along and saw it, that would be another thing. He's describing yeah. somebody else that would take Yeah. He's not describing himself. Oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Well, that would be nice. You know, yeah. I'm reading this and oh. I'm thinking, well, um, he describes this guy actually walking towards him yeah. in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, in the middle of a um, huge storm. Certainly. And the storm, uh -huh. you know, abates as he walks towards him. And okay, you know, Jesus yeah. is mythological, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. this is definitely a historical yeah. 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 saint having written this. So, you know, I'm wondering. I, what you see, we're on, I think, if we don't destroy ourselves. Mankind, I think, finally is at the point where we can now make scientific studies. What do we mean by science? I mean, carefully defined, well-identified descriptions of states of mind. I would like to see this to take place. I'd like to see the full range. What is the range of the mind? What is the reach of the mind? How far? What is its scope? So that we could then put them into such a structure with all the physiological readings, if necessary, of all the psychological states encountered, all of it. This is really the study of man. This, this, should, be, this should be psychology. But they got off on a bad, you know, <laughs> bad step and they went into pathology. I always talk to students and I say, what's it like taking psychology? And they go, uh, who, do, you know, who wants to spend your entire semester reading about pathology when everyone has an interest in themselves, relationships, family. This is what they want to know about. And they've got textbooks written by, well, I'll leave that out. Most of their studies, I mean, it's either yeah. pathology or it's yeah. other psychology students because they're the cheapest people to do research on. Yeah, this should be transpersonal psychology, but even they have trouble getting into it. And, but that's rather, that's rather nice because that means then philosophy can take over where they're reluctant to proceed. And I think that's appropriate. Good, good, good. You were um, differentiating earlier between <coughs> fantasy and belief, and I wasn't aware that there was a difference. Vanity? Fantasy and belief. Fantasy. 
A fantasy is what you do with the image that incorporates and represents the belief. See, a belief is a belief about yourself. Not any belief. It's a belief. They're related. Right? If you have a belief about yourself, you also have a belief about the nature of reality. Because that's what you think is real. Whatever image you have of the self, whatever is contained within it, like a seed, plays itself out in these stories. These stories are fantasies or daydreams. There are two kinds. One is those that come spontaneously, and that's what I've been talking about tonight. But they can equally be studied if you manufacture your own and watch those too. That's another class. With this, to do it properly would be to equally study your dreams and see the dream figures come up. If you can do that, put that into it, and get this kind of reflection going, you would have a very fine time exploring yourself wherever you do it. Yeah. Last week you mentioned the idea of just concentrating on one of the important questions, you know, what is the good, what is the one, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, could oh. one do that within the context oh. of... Oh, thank you. <laughs> what would be a real good goal, see. Get the best goal. Well, how do you get the best goal? Well, what I've found is if you explore, um, see, how does the mind rest? It rests when you have settled things in yourself. That's what I'm doing. If there's still some things that are seeking resolution, the mind is not at rest. Now, what is significant about that is that, see, in the mind, we have fragments of a different kind that need to come together. And these fragments are fragments about the nature of reality. And of the self. Therefore, a kind of guided meditation on uh, two, two things. One would be, what, after all, is the one itself. I take that as a question. What, after all, is the one in itself? Equally well, a more formal, a more formal study of the one would be to take Proclus's 13th proposition, where he is going to establish a way of reasoning so that you can see that the idea of the highest good and the one are equivalent, or are the same, or identical. Do you oh. Pardon me? Do you advise sitting with that? I didn't. Do you advise meditating with the 13th proposition if you can memorize it? Uh, I have run Zen centers where we've used this as a meditation. Really? Yeah. Spend four days or so on. It. Oh, yeah, very, very productive. Because See, one of the things you have to face is the terrible but interesting question of, all set, here it comes. Is the name of God misapplied? Have we named whatever it is we mean by God, God? Is there a higher name for God? Could that be the one? See, if I were to ask you, okay, now contemplate, contemplate in any way or just reflect right now about the nature of God. What evidence is there? Can you look for that there's such a thing as a divinity? All right, got the question? All right, take a moment out and try to think about it. Now I'll ask the next one. All right. Would you agree that whatever you see in this room right now Whatever you're looking at is a one. 
Whatever you look at is a one. Whatever you look at, whatever you look at is a one. Whatever you focus on is a one. As you're listening to my voice, every word is a one. You bring all of the, the particular words together as a unity, that's a one. You try to understand the, what I'm saying in each sentence as a one in respect to other things that I've been exploring. You try to bring about all of that together back to this particular question we're looking at. When you go to your car, one, car. Whatever you're doing, you're in seeing, are you not? Over and over again, nothing other than ones. Look here, an orchestra. It has to be a one. Otherwise, just a bunch of people getting together with instruments. It's only when they blend together and seek some higher principle, they become a more unified one, and they can produce something noble. A mob is just individuals that are swept along by perhaps one emotion or another or another. But get those same people, put them in uniform and discipline them, and what do you have? You have a higher degree of unity, don't you? A different kind of one. Wherever you see them, there are different kinds of one. In every kind of reflection you have, it's about something that's a one, and you're now exploring nothing other than different cases of one. Would you not agree? All of the things that you see, they are one, but each one is different from the other. So you're face to face with a one which is common, and yet what applies to is different. Even twins are different one from the other. Well then, hey look here. If everything has a tinge of red to it, we can ask, what's red? Why does everything have that tinge of red? Wait a minute. If everything is a one, then what's the one in itself? Where did the one come from? How does the one manifest itself? Why is it you only encounter one? Are you a one? What's the difference between exploring this idea of the one and the other one we had, which is, all right, let's talk about the nature of God. Do you see evidence of God? What's different of the two? Well, the idea of God has all kinds of preconceived ideas about what it's supposed to be. And how you should relate to it. Or him, or her, or it. You're not supposed to know it. You can't know it. it. Has accumulation, all of these things. Even the word God, by the way, comes from the root of the word for sacrifice. It's what you sacrificed before. But how about the one? If you could see that the highest notion of God can be said to be the one, it drops all of those associations, doesn't it? And then you can see that you can't avoid one. Okay, then what is the one in itself, just by itself? What is it? I'll tie this in with, hey, wait a minute. Among the many things that are good, there are a wide variety of things that are good, are they not? Good. By the way, is there something that's common to them all by virtue of which we seek it? Would you not agree you're only here because you think you might get something good? Well, then we're guided by what's good. I go for this goal because I think it's good. I think I may be better, I may be bettered by it. Right? I may think, therefore, that in being bettered by it and benefited by it, I will be changed in, in a better way. Right? Then all we're doing is seeking the good, are we not? In everything we do. Well, what's the relationship between the good and the one? Well, there's a whole beautiful seven sentences in Proclus' 13th proposition about the identity of these two. If you were to sit with these two questions, knowing them, so you can't, you have to memorize this. You have to memorize it. Why is that important? Because then you can settle with it. You can reflect on it. It's yours. What will that do? You see these different conflicts we have about the word God, right? change it to the one, and these parts can come together in a different way, can't they? Can't they, see? Subtle. It's so loaded, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, yeah. Very good, very good, see? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right? All right. Thank you for coming. Enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Pleasure.